Hi, welcome to another video. So today looking at an HD1801 powerful subwoofer amplifier. This one I think has got a faulty power supply. So before I go any further, before I start stripping it down, turn the power, that's what we've got thermal and signal limit light. Volume knobs already missing. So the polarity works, power light on. That doesn't seem to work. I've got no power light down there. So no power light there, just those two lights there and the system's dead. So before I forget, I took ages to find this circuit drawing for the power supply, switch mode power supply. Actually it says there, 18 inch high definition powered subwoofer. So couldn't find a circuit drawing for the switch mode power supply. Without that, it's gonna be stuffed because it looks complicated. So a little tip, go to Mackie.com support schematics loudspeakers SRM series because there isn't I don't think there was an HD series but look SRM 1801 and there's a power supply but here's a look at the other side this is the output to the speakers. Not sure what's under here. So this is the output to the speakers. I know on the SRM, which I looked at the other week, you can these are closer together and you can get this back to front. But this little plug plugs in there. And that will only reach the input board when it's turned round this way which means it can't go that way because the plug won't reach. I don't know why it's a bit of an add-on, same on the SRM AZ-01 as well. That's an add-on stuff down the side and bolts to the case. Mm, odd. But anyway, that's the output to the subwoofer. That's the amplifier, class D, 1000 watts. And that's the switch mode power supply, humongous. And this is the input board. So I've already taken this power supply out once already and I thought well I'll put it back and let you see the uh, repair from the start. Actually this has only been on a few minutes and this heat sink's warm so part of the power supply is working. This is stone cold. Right so I've taken this power supply off and look big burn mark there. But look this is what I detest. Someone's been at it. So what I need to ascertain is did this, at, did this power supply work after the repair? If it did, all well and good. But inside here, so we've got two transformers. I haven't seen a PFC uh, booster on in the circuit drive, but in here, not sure if you can see, some of the surface mount resistors have been obviously blown and bypassed. There's a track that's got hot. Down there, not sure if you can see resistors standing up there, two joined in series in place of one surface mount. So it's sort of been bodged. But if it repaired, doesn't you know if it repaired the power supply, it doesn't matter. But I'd sooner see the genuine components. So because of these sort of bodged repairs, I don't know, did this power supply work or did it work properly? Right, so this 1801 switch mode power supply seems to be getting more interesting by the minute. I assumed because we had those two lights, uh, we, you know, we were missing one of the supplies. I'd previously tested the bulky output on this eight-way connector to the amp. There was no supplies, sort of plus or minus 75. Yeah, that's roughly what you got on a 1000 watt amp. So you've got this ribbon cable with a I don't know, I don't know, 15, 20 wires, however many there are, that runs to that input board, uh, which has also got those LEDs. So I thought, right, I'll check the supplies there. We obviously got some supplies because we had the red and orange LED on. Hopefully you can see these numbers. There's loads of test points, like TP52, 53, 50, 51, 48, 49. 54, I'm sure I'm getting a tingle off that. <laughs> yeah, there are some pins though, uh, and it is turned on. 
but these are actually all grouped depending on you know, what voltage you're measuring. So let me just show you and I'll put the meter in shot. So I was hoping it's not going to be one of those super clever power supplies where because I've got the ribbon cable unplugged it's not going to boot up but it doesn't seem to be the case. So if I start at the beginning, uh, what's of the basics? Plus minus 15 for that front end amplifier, which all the Mackies I've come across, they use plus minus 15. So looking at the circuit drawing, which belongs to the SRM1801, don't forget. So minus 15, TP55, common is TP... No, minus 15, TP55, common is TP56, plus 15, TP54. So, and you'll remember they're all grouped together on that board. So let's, so common TP56, and I'll 55 and 54. Common TP56. So common 56, 55 is beneath, and 54 is above. So common is 56. That's that middle terminal there. So if I measure 55, you'll see we've got minus 14.7, so minus 15, that's good. And hopefully not get my hands in the way. And it's all low voltage down this end, so not too worried about getting an electric shock. TP54, what's the other one? So we've got plus and minus 15, so that's good. That's that front end amplifier working. But then it shows 52 and 51 and 53 is a 12 volt, which we've got nothing. Then we've got plus 5 volt, nothing. And then plus 48, nothing. Up at these top terminals. But, so we've got nothing here. Plus 48 and there's a ground or virtual ground. So plus 48, ground. We've got nothing there, plus five volts with a look that's a adjustable regulator, plus five and ground, nothing there, plus 12 ground, nothing there. But this is all off one transformer T4, T4C, T4B, T4A. So you can't have like this part working plus or minus 15 without any voltages here. So that plus 48, for example, it's TP48 and TP49, which is, every time I touch this lightly, I'm getting a tingle. <laughs> so TP48 and 49, but if you follow, so the ground goes back to the coil, the transformer, but look at these, we've got two regulators missing here. And that's the plus 48, and I believe it's the plus five. The plus 12 doesn't have any regulator, so nothing coming through the board to indicate it's not going to be there, but there's loads of component holes here not filled. So I'm assuming we haven't got the 48, haven't got the 5, and haven't got the plus 12, but we've got the plus or minus 15. So that first part of the switchboard power supply, I'd say it's spot on. You can see these unpopulated bits here so that's a bit of a red herring so we've got plus and minus 15 that's good enough for the front end amplifier right so the big supplies sort of plus minus 75 go to the amp via these connectors which is under here now I did a quick check on those yesterday and there was nothing there so I figured this power supply was dead and you could see yeah, some of those SMD resistors been bypassed I thought it's gonna be a nightmare to me ages to find the drawing for this but I thought it's going to be one of those amps I can't fix not without the circuit drawing and I don't know what someone's done but I've just measured this plus or minus 75 they're there plus minus 12 volts if you see my videos on the Mackie class D amp you need we need plus or minus 75 for the base and we need 12 volts for the base driver and the 12 volts like the Mackie SRM 450V2 the 12 volts is with reference to minus 75. Common is TP28, which is this connector here. TP27, 
is plus 75, which is his bottom connector. And you see we've got 79 volts. It's obviously off load. And the minus 75 is TB29, which is this one at the top. Minus 79. But I don't actually see any tracks on this side, so there must be tracks on the other side linking that minus 79, minus 75 volts. So we've got plus and minus 75, so that's good. That only leaves plus 12. Actually, looking at the circuit drawing, the plus 12 is plus 20. And the common for the plus 20 is the minus 75. So my money is on that plus 20 is used for the gate driver for the base fits. So common to TP29. So this was the minus 75, minus 79 volts, remember? That's now the common or the ground for the plus 20. So now we want TP30 for the plus 12. And that's what that one this is higher voltage, so I've got to be careful. TP30 is just there. There we are, 19 volts, with using the minus 75 as a ground. Same as the Mackey version two. Yeah, they've got plus minus 12, but this is uh, plus 20, using minus 75 as a ground, and then plus minus 75 volts, so nothing new there. So we've got the supply for the amp, supply for the front end, no 48, but components missing, no 5, components missing, and I think there was another smaller supply, but that's not populated, so this power supply looks like it's working. So if I've got no supply there when this is plugged in, this power supply isn't blowing up as it may do on the Mackie version 2, it's going into current limit, fantastic. Better start looking at the amp. So before I start looking at the amp, this power supply is also used in one of the powered mixers. The mixer's got a lot of digital equipment. So I imagine these parts are populated maybe for the mixer. So this regulator, whatever it is, transistor missing, U10. That is the 317 adjustable voltage regulator that gives us plus 48 volts. So no 48 because of that, that's missing. So on the other side, U11 regulator is missing. That's a 1117 adjustable. Yeah, that's 1117, I've used those before, but in a smaller package. That's a five volts, five volt regulator. And finally, there was no regulator for the plus 12, which we miss, were missing, but after the diode from this transformer, T4, and you can see down there, T4, D25, not populated, and it was L9, and there's L9, so those are vertical chokes for filtering, so L9, L11, there's not a choke on the other side, I didn't see, so no 48, no 5, and no 12. So that's all good, so this is giving us plus minus 15 to this connector only. Let's look at the top side for the plus minus 75 and plus 20. And when this was plugged in, it was actually getting warm. So this obviously does all the big power. And this transformer does a smaller, you know, plus minus 15, plus minus 79. So even though this looks like it's been bodged with these non-surface mount resistors, there, 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 looks like loads of surface mount transistors and components have been changed blobs of solder everywhere but they've done a good job it's working so that's all good news
Right, so here's a look at the amp. All looks rather simple, doesn't it? So this is the output. Don't know why the output always seems to be an afterthought with spade connectors. And that output output board. It's the same on the, as I said, the new SRM 1801s. This board bolts to the case. And with the orientation of these receptacles, it's difficult to know where they go on the other model. Uh, but these you can't mix up. The other one you can, you can go up one or down one. But it bolts to the case, so you put that on the case first and then connect it to the amp. So this presumably filters out the 400 kilohertz to the speaker. Not sure what this is. Could be a mini relay or something. Not sure. I'll have to have a look at the circuit drawing. So that's the output board. That's the output connectors. Power supply, filter caps, presumably. Looks like there might be a relay. That's the class D output coil. So that's all straightforward enough. If you look at this 1801, you know, without the circuit drawing and breaking it down, it looks like a bit of a nightmare, but have a look at this. Now I had a look at it a couple of seconds ago. If I can zoom you in a bit. This looks like it might be really easy. So these two chips here, PV UZ IRS 2092, these are IRS, I think they're 2095. So the 92s are not directly compatible with the 95, but these are a current chip and you can get them for a few pounds each. So 500 watt amp there, 500 watt amp there, small case transistors, but they've got the metal tabs so they can handle more wattage. Uh, so there's the 500 watt amp for the negative half cycle and 500 for the positive bridged into the subwoofer. So this might be easy. Not sure what this chip is here. I've not looked at the circuit drawing yet. Not sure what these pots do. Uh, so, looks like a fairly simple amp. Smoothing caps on the input. That's the coil to take out the 400 kilohertz. What if it's dual? Oh yeah, this I was going to say dual because 400 kilohertz on a plus and 400 kilohertz on a minus wires. But there's the other one in there. So, two mono amplifiers driving the output. Can be easier. Maybe a relay in there. A couple of big resistors. So one half will do the positive, one half will do the negative. Not sure what this one in the middle does. But looks like it could be fun. So I need to get this heat sink off. Maybe test those transistors, make sure they're not short circuit. I'll, I'll do that first. Make sure these aren't short circuit. Then put the power supply back on and see this power supply. See, why are we losing that supply? I'm guessing something on this amp is short circuit. Fingers crossed. So I thought before I strip this down, I'll do a quick test of these transistors, FETs, they'll be FETs for class D amplifier. So don't forget you can, if you turn on the gate of a transistor, it will read as a short circuit. So you can, oh, I found a short circuit, but it's not, you just turn the gate on and the measuring source to drain usually doesn't happen in the circuit but let's get this light out of this meter well this meter is on diode test so you can't see it well with the light but you'll be able to hear it so this first transistor on this channel so I'm on diode test I don't know the orientation so that's one junction But see that 5.5, so that's probably a diode or a resistor on the gate. So nothing to rejoice about. But if I come across the middle pin, that's another junction there. Could be that diode on the driver or something, or it's actually connected to this FET on this one. So it looks like it's okay. We haven't got a short circuit. 
So just swap the orientation. Don't know. We'll have to take them out and check them off the board. Come over to this side. Well, that is not a component. That is a short circuit. Test this one, look. Onto the outside pin. Dead short. Dead short. Dead short. Dead short. So, dead short on the output of this side. We're measuring that transistor and that transistor. So it looks like this is the extra one here. Not sure what it is. Could be a regulator for that 20 volts. So these two FETs short circuit. Excellent. Hi, so I've taken this 1801 amplifier off, taken the heatsink off. That's the odd transistor by itself. I think it's a 317 adjustable voltage regulator. Not sure where it's used. Don't need to know at the moment. But I've taken the four driver FETs off. So that's the 500 watt driver chip, similar to the PV. The PV has the IRS2092. These are the newer version 2095, and they're not interchangeable. I checked with the manufacturer. So it's essentially two amplifiers. That's a 500 watt amp, and that's a 500 watt amp. Two lots of FETs per channel, class D, these take out the 400 kilohertz to the positive half cycle and the negative half cycle. That's a relay to cut it in or out, depending on what it's doing. So these FETs, you remember when I tested them in the circuit, I was getting maybe two pins with short circuit, but not, not all three. And I'll show you what's going on. Oh. So when I was testing these FETs, you remember you can get duff readings when they're in the circuits and if they're a FET, you can inadvertently turn the junction between the drain and source on and you measure it as, as a short circuit. So I'll show you what I was doing. Let's check them all. I've actually already tested them, but I've now mixed them up. But let me show you the uh, trap you can fall into. So, I put my meter in view. Hopefully this camera is not going to refocus as it sometimes does. Right, so I don't know this FET, not, not sure what sort. Oh, it's going to be an end channel, but I don't know where the drain gated source is. So let's start here. There to there, nothing. There to there, nothing and then move this left hand one to the middle pin. Short circuit. So short circuit on these outside two, or sorry, these right two pins. So red in the middle, black on the outside. Swap the leads around. Still short circuit, but watch. I now move this black. So with this red in the middle, move this black to this outside one, touch it and then come back, the short circuit is gone. So by me probing these pins, that red and this one, I've turned on the junction between the drain and the source. And now by putting this black one there, I've opened the junction. So look, this isn't short circuit anymore. If I move these leads around now, that's the gate and source of gate and drain, great, gate and source junction, half a volt on diode test. So that one looks like it's okay. Same again on this one. All right, short circuit between that and the middle one and the outside one. So that's it, that's faulty, that's short circuit on all the pins. Next one, short circuit between the left and the middle and the left and the right. So short circuit. And finally, nothing there. Oh, I'm on the left and the middle, and then the right, 
and then the middle to the right, nothing. So I hadn't turned this FET on. Just make sure the junction's right, there we are, half a volt. So as with all the transistors that I think are suspect, I put them on my Peak Atlas tester. So this one had a slightly lower voltage drop on the gate and source, so enhancement mode and general MOSFET. Source gate drain. Gate threshold, 4.5 volts. Test current, 2.5 milliamps. And that's it. So that fits all right. I'll obviously do it with all of them. But here's one of the fets where they were all the pins were shorting out. So if you're repairing amps for a living, take the guesswork out. This is the suspect 41. Short circuit on red, green, and blue. So that's faulty. See now I've mixed them up. I'm not sure which is which, but let's say this Atlas tester takes all the guesswork out. About 50 pound. So gate threshold voltage 4.52. So that was right. And then last but not least, yeah, so this must be the second short circuit one. Yeah, short circuit, red, green and blue. I'll bend those pins so I don't use them. So I thought this was going to be a nightmare. You saw the burn mark on the case. Tracks have been repaired. Uh, surface mount resistors have been replaced with big resistors. But you know, there's a blobs of solder everywhere, but it looks like they've done a good job. This power supply is still working. So I'm really happy about that. And looking at the circuit drawing, break it down into chunks. So plus or minus 15 here, plus or minus 75 there. So that's like two separate power supplies. That's the filter for the mains input. Stops the switch mode noise getting back out. This has no PFC circuit, which I'm surprised about, because it's over 600 watts consumption. Uh, just rectifies the mains. 320 volts runs into our power supply and we get our various voltages out. But the really good news about this is that amp has short, uh, the amp has a short circuit and this went into current limit, presumably with that little transformer down there, either that one or that one, and it's protected itself, which is really good news. Fantastic. So I'll order these transistors, put them back in and go from there. So looking at these, where these FETs go, the gate resistor is 20 ohm. I've just tested these, 22 ohm. These are all 22, 22, these big ones. Little one there on the gate, 20 ohm. If you've seen my, why we must use gate resistors, 20 ohm is actually quite low and there's a diode across it. So we know we charge up the gate capacitance via that 20 ohm resistor discharge it through a diode. So before you go ordering all your replacement parts, just make sure those low value resistors are okay. And make sure the diodes aren't short circuit. But yeah, so 20 ohm, I've not looked at these yet, how much they are, but with a 20 ohm gate resistor, I'm assuming the total input capacitance is low. Just a bit of uh, more technical info. Hi, so this is part two of this HD1801. It's been a couple of weeks, so I had to order some parts. Now for you, this is all happening in, you know, five, 10 minutes of the first part. But for me, this is a couple of weeks later. 
So first of all, this is the amplifier. And you remember earlier on I said it's 500 watt and 500 watt. It's a mono sub with an amplifier. So that does a positive half cycle and this does a negative or, you know, vice versa. But you get the picture. And all I found was this power supply had previously been repaired, but it looked like it was all working. So I thought, well, fair enough. Some of the components that have been bodged in are these resistors down there. Various parts have been swapped over. You know, non-surface mount when they should be surface mount. Uh, and some tracks on the bottom have been repaired. But I thought, well, it's working. So, And you remember, I didn't have any supply over here. So two of these FETs were short circuit. And this power supply was going into current limit. I thought, thank God for that, because you know someone's been at it. I'd hate to have to go back and see what they've done wrong. That was going into current limit, knocking off the plus and minus 79. So plus 79, minus 79. It was going into current limit because these were short circuit. So I changed these before Christmas, turned it on, and I still had these two lights. So signal limit and thermal. Uh, no power light down the bottom. So I went back to this power supply. Recheck the fence. No, blown up again. So had to change them again. And there's only one reason why two fets on one channel will blow up at the same time. Let me show you. It's a circuit drawing. So there's two of the fets on one of the channels. There's one channel and another channel down below. Right, so for both of these transistors to go at once, you've got plus 75 here, minus 75 here somewhere, there. And this 500 watt amplifier chip, very similar to the PV and one of the Wharfdales, this 500 watt chip drives the positive half cycle and then the negative half cycle. So plus 75, minus 75, and the speaker is in the middle. For both of those to blow up at once, it means they're both on at the same time, which can only mean this is faulty. So before Christmas, had a look at these. So although this circuit drawing shows IRS20955, I checked the chips under a magnifying glass. And I've forgotten what they are, let me check. They are IRS20957S. So I ordered some from China, ordered four. I thought a couple for this one, a couple for spare. A couple just in case, you know, you blow one up. So after changing both of these chips, I turned it on again last night. As I say, had my supplies, but no, still the red and orange light. Oh, here we go. So I took the metal cover off this input board and there's various hop amps. Trouble with this board, a lot of it's straightforward, but none of the identification matches up with the circuit drawing. For example, this one here, that says U113. Well, on the circuit drawing, there's not a U113. There's like U1, U2, U3, U4, not U113 and U110, U111. That's the comparator and it compares voltages. And if something's not right, it throws on the light. So I thought, right, what does it need to throw on a light? So here's one of the input board circuit drawings. Seems to be sort of right. So I've got input A and input B down the bottom. Then you've got high pass, but it's all the identifications of these chips, like U10. So A is obviously for the half of the chip then you'll be, have uh, B for the other half. So look, U10, U6, U6, U11. I haven't got those. I've got like U111 and U110, but not necessarily in the right order. So that made it difficult. So I checked various signals uh, running through your pumps, uh, and they seem to be right. But so I came to this comparator. Hopefully I'm in the middle of the screen here. And so it controls the thermal light and the power on light. So we didn't have a power on next to the switch and we did have the thermal light. So if you look at this, this LED, regular LED, 
The positive is ground, which means this chip has to go negative, swing negative, to turn it on. You know, obviously the anode of the cathode has to be negative with respect to the anode. And if the anode's at ground, means the cathode has to swing negative. And so if that swings negative, it's stopping this power LED from turning on. Because you see there, that's ground. So if that's positive with respect to the cathode, look at the cathode, minus 15. But so minus 15 there, and then if this swings low, because that's swinging low, it will knock the power off and obviously bring on the thermal light. So I thought, right, this comparator, what supplies that? If you have a look at the resistors, 20K there, 20K there, plus 15 in ground, means we've got seven and a half in the middle, but they've you know, mentioned it there anyway. 7.5. So if the inverting input is greater than the non-inverting input, it will swing negative. Or if this non-inverting input is greater like, than 7.5 volts, it will swing positive. So because this LED is on, it must be swinging negative. And it was, I'd sort of, I don't know, roughly minus 15 here. I'd minus 15 there because I'd nothing on the non-inverting input, which means the inverting input is greater than the non-inverting. So if that's greater, it's gonna swing negative. If that was less than this, it'd swing positive. So trace this back. And my battery just ran out on the camera, so I've got to do this bit again. Well, so if we follow this comparator back, so this is the thermal, brings on the thermal light and knocks off the power light. Come back here, oh, here we go to the power supply. Come down there, and what I didn't notice earlier, but it says a limit. So now you've got to go to the limit on the power supply. Oh, well, here we go. That was five or six hours ago. Well, so we, here's a power supply drawing. So we know from earlier, we had our plus 77, minus 77, actually I think we're up here. So it actually says 75. Uh, plus 75 minus 75 and 15 plus and minus 15 volts. We know we already had those, but then going back to this limit, which is here, I thought, oh, another opto isolator, same as a wharf tail, ended up chasing that around for a lot of hours. So this is six hours later I've discovered you know, what's happening. So this opto isolator, that is grounding that line. Now that line on the board now we use the opto isolator because they've got different reference, different ground references on here. On the power supply chip, this be like, I don't know, plus, um, yeah, plus 12 volts and ground, but this ground is half of the mains potential. So you can't take this ground and just ground the plus and minus 15 ground, the different potentials. So that's why we use an opto isolator yeah, so that's why we use an opto isolator, different ground potentials. So if there's a fault, this opto isolator turns on via these components and it pulls this down to ground. And so on that limit line, which is the thermal light, that's being pulled down to ground, bringing on the light and knocking off the power light. So right, what controls this? This transistor. Have a look at this base, so it's an NPN, so we need a positive potential on this base. Positive with respect to ground to turn that on, and that will pull that down. Come back around here. So that base of that transistor comes round as the output of this device. I thought, what was that? 556, five, I thought, I know that number. 556 five, is a two 555s. Five, five, five. There's one half of the 555, or 556, yeah, there's one, one half, and the other half over here. Now, why would you want to use a timer chip on an amplifier? 
I think in this case, so when it turns on, it brings on the LEDs and a couple of seconds later, they go off. And that couple of seconds later is where this little capacitor charges up. So how does this 555 work? So I had to go back, you know, I used to use them sort of 30 years ago. I had to go back, right, the trigger has to fall below the supply by, is it two thirds? That has to drop by two thirds to trigger this 555. You will then get an output. And I had the output. I had nine, nine volts here, I think, 10 volts here. So that was turning on, it's grounding that limit line. So coming back to here, this was part of that modified power supply, or you had previously repaired. I thought, right, I'll check this capacitor. Once the trigger has dropped below the supply, comes back up again. I thought I'll check these, this other comparator. But here we go. You have to start analyzing what does that do, that and that. This one is similar to the Mackie, I think. So if you look, 39K, 470K, 470K, and then VDCH, that's the mains. That VDCH, that's a sort of high potential uh, on the mains. So coming back down here, I imagine this first comparator is checking that's probably a mains under voltage thresh threshold. So if it's too low, it will trip this and pull this down uh, and knock out that limit or knock it on. So that, that, that's probably a, a, a mains on, under voltage. Then there's two other comparators over here. Wire to a little, I think it's a current transformer. Here, you can see a bridge rectifier set up there. Very light load, because I probed one of these and the amp turns off for a second and back on. This little transformer is next to a big one, but anyway, I thought, look at these, right? Which one of these lines is pulling this trigger down? And I tested that and that and that. You know, pin one, 13 and 14, they were all up at five volts. Five volts is the reference from this chip which you might be familiar on the Mackie. Five volt reference. So I thought, right, if we've got five volts there, there and there, it's actually just 4.6, but so we've got five volts here, here, here. Why is this trigger down at nothing? I thought, is this 556 faulty? So this capacitor had nothing on it. Hopefully it's in view. This capacitor had nothing on it. So I thought, right, this capacitor should charge up. Once the trigger has dropped below the supply and then come back up again, this capacitor should be charged by this 390k and the 5 volt reference. But this was staying at zero volts. So because it's staying at zero volts, 555 is not resetting and we've got an output. So I thought, right, let me, dis let me disconnect this discharge resistor, 100 ohm resistor, disconnected that, and the capacitor came up. So the capacitor came up, that should have reset that, and the output should have gone off, but I still had an output. So I came over to this transistor. I thought, well, that had actually been touched. So this is that 100 ohm uh, capacitor discharge for the 555, and that's that transistor. So that transistor should be an NPN. Put my meter on it, and just for the novice, in case you're not sure about these transistors, Every transistor SOT23 that I've tested, the base has always been that bottom left-hand corner. So base, emitter, collector. I'm not sure if they vary on other packages, but base, emitter, collector. Really easy to test. So I put my meter on diode test, put the positive here, didn't get connection. Swapped them around, put the negative here, negative probe, positive here, I've got continuity. That means this is a PNP and it should be an NPN. And incidentally, while I'm here, those are those two FET drivers. As I say, I didn't know which channel on an amp had gone. So I thought, well, they're only a pound or two each, so I changed them both. And which came first, the chicken or the egg? Did the transistors blow this up, or did this go faulty and keep both transistors switched on at the same time? I'm assuming the latter. So I think this failed and blew up those two FETs. So in the circuit drawing, that little transformer is this one down here. 
so I'm not it's got one big winding on one side and lots on the other so I'm not sure if it's like a current transformer this chip here is that dual 555 and then this one underneath you probably can't see is the comparator and that transistor well, I don't know how well this camera can focus but so that's the 556 that's the discharge resistor just in there that's the capacitor that charges up and the transistor is just down here and it was a wrong sort and you can see one of the bodges but you know if, if it bodged it and fixed it then that's all well and good but some of the bodges have you know repaired most of the power supply but we've still got this issue with the limit because it hasn't been done properly right here we go there's the mains so as I say, I used to have the thermal and the signal limit light on and there was nothing else, but I've just swapped that incorrect transistor. Stuck in a 3904, it had previously probably been a 3906, so you should mark your components. These are 3904s and the marking on them 1A. So if I ever lost the transistors out of the packet, I can identify them. Here goes nothing. Hello. So we've got no thermal lights on anymore. I've just heard a relay click. Thermal lights gone out after a time. So that's that capacitor on the 556 charging up to give us our delay to test these lights. And our power light is now on. And what happened when I actually got the amp running correctly? So two new chips. Uh, four FETs, yeah, so two new chips, two FETs that I had to replace twice because the chip blew them up again. So two new chips, two FETs, the fans came on. So we now we've got fans and we've got a power light. So now presumably our limit line won't be pulled down to minus 15. It'll be up above that 7.5 threshold because we've got our power light. So I'll just have to uh, put it back together and see if we can get some sound out of it. Fingers crossed. So some, yeah, that was my fear. Someone had been at this power supply. They had repaired most of it, but yeah, just a uh, yeah, wrong transistor. They probably could have been on it for weeks and weeks because they would have replaced that transistor thinking it was okay because they replaced it but they replaced it with the wrong sort. Let me um, put some signal into this and see if we can get something out of it. Right, so we're definitely getting somewhere. That transistor, definitely wrong type. So I'll swap that back over, put the discharge resistor back in on that 556 circuit. So turn the power on. Just had a click. So those timers will be used to bring on these lights to test them and then knock them off. And as they go off, the power comes on. If I turn the power off, you see these come back on. Just saw that that's all the caps discharge. So I've got my signal coming in here for my scope. I've got 200 millivolts, 100 hertz, Turn this back on. These lights didn't come back on because that those caps hadn't discharged. Well, so we've got our power light. I'll turn on my 200, uh, I'll turn on my 100 hertz at 200 millivolts. And we've got a signal light. So to establish what the threshold on that is, I'll turn the output on my signal generator down. Right, that's gone off at 10, 10 millivolts, which is the lowest this signal generator goes down to, I think. So it's just come on there at 15 millivolts, peak to peak. So turn it back up to 200. Remember, it's a sub, so you've got to have the frequency down to sort of 100 hertz. Well, that's 200 millivolts coming out of the scope. 
over there. Got our signal light, no thermal fault, the polarity reverse, power. I think this power light is for the front front of the speaker light, front of the sub. So there's, I've swapped this uh, over. I use, usually use this 4 ohm to test Mackie SRM 450s, but I think these subs are meant to be 8 ohm and I think they're fussy. So I've stuck at the, the I've stuck the tweeter resistor off for the Mackie in line so we've got 8 ohm load. So we should have a positive half cycle here and negative over there, but we've got nothing. So going back to this board, the input's over there. Remember what I said, this is two 500 watt amps amplifying a pos positive half cycle and a negative. So I can test those points down here as it goes back out to the amp. What I'll do, I've set, set this up already, so let me uh, show you the scope. Right, so I'll probe those two pins, positive and negative. So there's one half, and there's the other half, which is why I put on two scope leads. So you can see one's out of phase with the other. So that's a sine wave. And if you've seen my other videos, you know how a sine wave is made up. You can see that we, so we've got the sine wave and then, in, and then the inverted wave, 180 degrees phase shift. So that's a positive and negative half cycle. So the amp must still have a fault because we've got nothing coming out. Just for reference, I was probing these second two pins over there. So the order comes in there through various amps. Through that comparator and then back out over there back up to the amp so we've got two good signals going in plus and minus nothing coming out this setup here similar to the Mackie SRM 450s I've had to look at the drawing and do some tests two pins must there must be a power lead or something on the front of the sub. So I've sellotaped these over. This is what I use for the Mackie SRM 450s. So two for the power lead and two for the woofer. And we've got nothing coming out. On this plug we've also got, so the, apart from the signals going in and out, uh, for A and the B channel. The B channel is just linked to the A. There's a switch down under here that just inverts the positive and negative. If you're running more than one sub, you can you might have a phase difference. You just split the phase, you know, swap the phase. But over on this plug, you've also got a 75 volt sense. Uh, and that's, although the drawing says 3.5 volts, I'm measuring three, so it looks like this circuit won't work if it doesn't see the 75 volts or at least part of it i'm going to finish up this video because this second part and the first part is you know is, is about 20 minutes so it's going to be a 40 minute video and i've not even finished repairing the amp yet so this is the amplifier circuit i'm mean, in summary i've got half the channel working or half the amp working because one of the four chips i ordered is working two were dead and one was doing something something odd uh, and where did i get those ebay and they're fakes this cost me 20 out 20 hours or more uh testing these circuits find out exactly how does this chip work yeah only to establish there was you know i changed these fats changed this that's it it should have worked it didn't because they're fakes fakes from China on eBay. Yeah, what more can I say? I was bitten 10 years ago. I should have avoided them. Farnell, Mouser, people like that don't supply them. Uh, I've now used UT Source, who are a reputable supplier, but now I have to wait another couple of weeks. So one is working, one isn't. When the new ones come in from UT Source, I'll swap them both over because the one that is working was actually intermittent. Didn't work for you know, a few seconds and then started working. So... So if your amp, if the FETs are blown, change this and those FETs. If you don't, you'll have the same trouble I had. 
these FETs will be short circuit, probably will either have destroyed the FET driver or the FET driver is the cause why they blew up. So order the FETs and order the driver specifically for this yeah, HD1801 sub. This bottom half is the same as the top half, so I'll just concentrate on the top half. We've got two amplifiers. One amplifies the top half of the signal, the other one does the bottom half of the signal. We've got plus and minus 15. That's actually split in one corner of the amplifier. You've got uh, a shutdown protection circuit in the corner of the amplifier. Looks at the output here, channel one left, channel one right, and ground. If there's a DC voltage, it shuts the chip down and opens a relay. Up here, that other transistor on the board, on the heatsink, that's our 12.5 volts from the 19 from the power supply. Yeah, plus and minus 15, and there's plus and minus 5 derived from the plus and minus 15 here. So this amplifier, the signal comes in. The most important part of it is actually this op amp here. It's a 10 megs uh, high speed op amp. The most that is in this application, it's called an integrator in a class D amp because it integrates the signal going through it with the output, which is now out of phase. Coming the output comes back round up positive feedback back to the input of this amp. So this mixes the signal with the output. And you know, with the function of this chip and that, it oscillates at 400 kilohertz. You get a square wave coming out of the output. This choke takes out the 400 kilohertz. Plus there's additional filtering on the extra board on this sub. But essentially you've got two drivers. There's high side driver and a low side driver. There's a low side FET and a high side FET. If I stick to the simple one first, this OC set, so overcurrent protection set. Overcurrent set is here. So we've got 5 volt reference for this function. 5 volt reference, look, 3K, 6K, down to ground or the virtual ground on this chip. If you look, 3K and a 6K, but we're tapping off after the 3K, so this is sits above half of that VREF. It's actually about 3.6 volts. If the low side driver FET, if that line, so I can't highlight it, if that line goes over 3.6 volts or this set to turn this transistor on, this chip will shut down. And similarly, this 6K8 and 3K here, that's for the high side. So if either of the lines have to exceed the set voltage, the chip will shut down. Obviously, you've got the external shutdown if there's a problem on the wires. So this op amp mixes the signal, comes in here, positive feedback, integrates that, you get the 400 kilohertz out. Or you should have just been able to change the chip, change the FETs, job done two weeks ago. But no, I've got fakes. And it's taken me a good 16 hours solid work testing all the components you know how do you know if one of these capacitors isn't shorting the signal out or pulling something down i did loads of voltage tests and they all looked okay but this chip was dead so i stuck another one in still dead but then the one i put in over here was giving me a two or three hertz kick on these fets every few seconds uh, or a few kicks a few times a second and then with the feedback from here that would come back back to this op amp which is known as an integrator and you'd see that kick back here which would then drive this again so just keep on repeating kick 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 and I thought is that trying to start a knot because of this no it was doing its own thing because it's a fake chip as I say I've got the TO9 I've got the IRS 20957S not the five fives. I see someone selling these five fives in this country for a tenner each. That's just a rip off. Uh, I've ordered mine from UT Source, who are a reputable supplier. So if these transistors are blown up, make sure you get one of these drivers or you'll be asking for trouble because 
if this is blown up and it keeps these two transistors on at the same time, you'll have the current shoot through, meaning the current shoots through both and it will destroy them in a nanosecond, you know, before you've even taken your finger off the on off switch. So that's it. It's a normal operational amplifier here that's common to the Mackies and loads of other gear. High speed op amp, uh, 10 megahertz high speed op amp. That's known as an integrator because it integrates the signal with the feedback. So this particular circuit that's running on my amp, just half of it running, it's actually near 500 kilohertz, which is touch fast, but you know, they blew up, took out the chip or the chip took them out and all these little capacitors that I spent hours and hours testing, now they're all fine. So it should be simple, yeah, change the chip, change the FETs, job done. But as you saw, I had a problem on the power supply as well, had to analyze that. Then look at the input board, you know, why was my thermal light coming on, that sort of stuff. So hopefully this video has helped you diagnose any faults on a Mackie SRM or HD1801 subwoofer. Thank you very much.